What's up, everyone? Before we get into the podcast, I have two giveaways. First off, Friday, September 27th at the House of Blues in San Diego. I have two sets of tickets for Sepultura, Obituary, Agnostic Front, and Claustrophobia. Dude, this is sick. 32 years ago, uh, AF and Obituary toured together after AF put out one voice. So this is a piece of hardcore history. Now you can run it back, handle business. Uh, Yeah, email me. 185 miles south at gmail.com. Put blind justice into last warning in the header of the email. And the first two people that get at me get a set of tickets. Also, Friday, October 4th at the North Island Credit Union Amphitheater in Chula Vista, California. Iron Maiden is back for the second year in a row. Dude, it took 20 years for Maiden to come back to San Diego. And now they're doing it uh, back to back years. So. Sick. Okay, I got two sets of tickets for this as well. You're up on the lawn with the real rockers. And, uh, you know, they say you haven't lived until you've gotten loose and slammed on an incline. So uh, you're going to want to participate in this. And if you don't win, dude, just buy tickets. It's fucking Iron Maiden. We want them to come back to San Diego every year. Uh, Email me, 185milesouth at gmail.com. You got to put Blaze Bailey seemed like a cool dude in the header of the email. And the first two people that email me with the correct stuff uh, get a set of tickets. All right, let's get on with the show. 185milesouth.com Smash that Patreon button. One hundred and eighty-five miles south, a hardcore punk rock podcast. What's up, everyone? We are back and talking hardcore, helping out uh, back after a minute. You know him, you love him. From in my eyes, it is Anthony Papalardo. What's up, Pops? What's up, everyone? What is going on? Also, helping out, I believe, back again for the fourth time on the pod. Dude, if you knew him in the 90s, you can call him Body Bag, but otherwise, you got to refer to him <laughs> as his proper title, Riff Master General <laughs> Sir. Uh, it's Todd Jones. <laughs> what up, Body Bag? <laughs> That's a great, a great introduction. Thank you, Zach. Appreciate that, dude. Let's just jump right in. Todd, you put out uh, the first Nails record in eight years. Uh, it came out on August thirtieth of this year. It is called "Every Bridge Burning." It came out on Nuclear Blast. How do you feel? Eight years is a long time, and you kind of rebuilt the band from scratch. What was the pressure here? Yeah, that's right. The band was rebuilt from scratch. I had to find all new members, um, and also. Um, you know, we were supposed to put out like an album in 2019. And every time I picked up the guitar, I just wasn't, I wasn't, nothing was really coming out and I wasn't really playing anything that I thought was inspiring. So aside from having to rebuild the band, I had to get through like a, a, a a mental writer's block. And uh, yeah, it was, it was definitely one of the biggest hurdles I've ever had to get to get over in my life. And um, just having it out is, is just like a huge immense relief and also like a moment of, um, you know, I'm extremely proud of the record. I love the record and I'm just so excited to uh, get back to playing shows and, and doing what bands do. Yeah. How do you, f- how do you feel like the reception has been so far and where do you think it stacks up against the rest of the catalog? Sure. So as far as uh, where I think it stacks up with the rest of the cl- catalog, I do think as far as quality, it's, it's definitely in line with the other three albums prior to it. Um, I think it's as good as any of those records. As far as the feedback, it's it's pretty polarizing. I, I've seen definitely more love for it than I've seen dislike, which feels really good. I've definitely seen some folks who just are not feeling it at all. I, I think, you know, there was a lot of like, um, on our last two records, uh, we were very inspired by like death metal. And on this record, that was not like an inspiration at all. So I think for the folks who really like nails, particularly for the death metal influenced like extremity of the band that may not be present here. 
um, you know, making this record with a band. I think I was, I was mostly focused on as more inspired from like more punk rock bands and also as more, it's just trying to make it hooky really. I like, I like, I like, I like uh, catchy music. So that's what I was trying to go for personally, uh, mainly vocally. I think that like the thing that set nails apart though, like through the whole catalog is you've always written catchy stuff, right? It might not always be in the vocal hook, but there's going to be big parts in almost every, there's either going to be like the fast blazer song, or there's going to be the songs with like the big parts, like that really cut up the records. Don't you think like you've already, you've, you've always written pretty catchy shit. I, yeah. I mean, I, the, the, when I first fell in love with music, you know, I, it was all about um, Nirvana, Nevermind and also the Metallica black album, you know, that that's, that's what made like really turn me on to get into music and then getting into punk rock, you know, getting into like suicidal tendencies, the first adolescence record, minor threat, all really catchy bands. And then, you know, getting into like um, the, the, the first 20 revelation records catalog and like the, this is, might not be the right term for it, but like the, the youth crew to stipe, type of music from the late 90s and early 2000s such as you know anthony was involved in a lot of records i really liked a lot um and really took a lot of influence from um the tenure fight hardcore pride ep and the demo and then you know the in my eyes demo and the first two albums like all, all that stuff to me is like very 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 catchy i've just i've always liked catchy music i've always like i've always just kind of gravitated towards that and i've always wanted to you know put in the music i make can we go back to the writer's block a little bit because i think there's a tie-in here that i was curious about so it kind of feels like to write to write catchy music like it has to be catchy to yourself first and and so i was wondering like i guess we could start with like your your process. Like I used to be really into recording everything, not everything I played, but I would have like, I have to record this. So I remember it. And then I started getting into being like, well, if I don't remember it, it sucks anyways, which maybe is a, is sort of a trap, but that was like one way to approach it. Like if I don't remember what this is, it's probably Garbo anyways. So like what, what got you out of that writer's block and how do you approach you know, coming up with stuff that you think is going to be memorable. I think I also fall into that trap. If I, if I don't remember it, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, garb garbage, or it's just not good. And that could, that could be harmful. Maybe. I don't know. I think Nick Cave even said the same thing uh, where he says, if he doesn't remember anything, then it's not worth doing to me. I think, how do I say this? Um, I, you know, I, I, it first starts off, I, I get inspiration from somewhere. Like w- one thing I've learned a lot in the past, like maybe five years is, uh, or maybe like eight or 10 years is um, writing music around vocal hook. So if I think of like some sort of, you know, phrase that I want to put into a song, I'll think of a vocal pattern and then I'll, and then I'll write like something under it, which is, which on the guitar is generally not the most interesting thing to play, but it's just something to accommodate like a vocal hook. But, um, but otherwise, other than that, like usually when I play guitar, I'm, I'm looking for riffs and or parts that sound like they would fit within the construct of the genre I'm writing music for, but also that are like kind of interesting and don't sound exactly like something a band like that would do. Like just, just something that kind of grabs the ear, but do, and doesn't sound like completely generic and work. And then I try to work around that. Do you ever, uh, do you ever trash things that are, I don't want to say too complicated, but they aren't, they might sound cool, but they're not fun to play. <laughs> uh, no, but, but, but I'll, I'll tell you this, like on the first nails record on silent death, that was probably like, um, musically, uh, our most probably simplest record. And those songs for me to sing and play guitar live are, way easier and way more fun than the songs on the following two records. And that's because I was, you know, we were very influenced by, by death metal stylings and playing that stuff accurately on guitar and singing to it requires a bit more focus. I have to be more mindful of that. So I, I like doing it. I love those songs. Still going to play them, but it, it, it's just it's harder to do. And on this this new record, Every Bridge Burning, I definitely f- wanted to get back to being a little bit more simplistic in the guitar and in, in the guitar stuff, so I could you know kind of have a little bit more fun on stage. With that being said, this there's like a little bit of a dichotomy to this new record because it I believe it does have like my most expressive guitar playing, but while at the same time like like it purposely laid back on some of the riffing to just kind of make it 
more catchy. I think when um, when you go full bore with extremity, you lose some of the catchiness. So like when you focus on hooks and, and songs being catchy, you kind of lose the extremity. Dude, it's funny that you talk about this being like more simple because if you locked me in a room like with this record for 10 years, I still can't come out playing it. You know what I mean? So <laughs> <laughs> everything's graded on a curve, right? Hey, Pops, did you ever get writer's block? Because your run between 95 and 2000 is pretty prolific and wild. Like when you look at it and you think about it, you, you didn't get it then at all, did you? It was more just being able to like trash things or... I also learned like when you bring a song to the band, it it's instantly sounds different. Right. And like sometimes like I kind of learned not to be like, Hey, don't play that part over it. Like, and just be like, no, that sucks. It's just not good. Like, let's not, this isn't um, King Crimson. Like we don't need to <laughs> labor over it and try and figure it out like a math problem. It's more or less like just being able to like cut the fat and just keep it moving or, try to salvage a part or whatever. But I, I'm, the, the main thing would be getting into like the youthy crew nursery rhyme trap where like stuff start, like maybe the fast part feels arbitrary. So I always felt like if the, if the fast part isn't good, like that's the engine of the song. It doesn't matter how cool of an idea for a breakdown or whatever you have is or an intro. So like that at least needs to be interesting. I think sometimes to a fault. Like I think some of the the songs on the second in my eyes got a little too like they're they're not they're not te- technical by any means, but like a little too cute at times, just trying to like do accents or whatever, like trying to spice up something that didn't need it. Well that that record was more like um how do I say it? That that record was more expressive on the guitar though than the previous in my eyes. Would is that would you say that's true? Yeah, a hundred percent because I mean it was just me writing everything and being like how much can i fit into a construct that i can't really break you know like there's yeah i I think like at that time like if if anything was it's also you don't want to like overshadow the rest of the stuff and i was just like okay like like even showing people stuff in practice that had like single notes would be like fuck i hope i hope they don't think this is corny you know, I didn't want people to be like, dude, we just got off tour with Good Riddance. What the fuck? You know, like, <laughs> you know, like, cause, cause that stuff, like, also, like, but through osmosis stuff creeps in. But for me, it was all like, it's, it's always been looking at like everything Brian Baker did, looking at Jason Farrell, probably like those two. And then being like, okay, how do I do my version? Because if you do Brian Baker too much, you're, you're like one of those bands, <laughs> you know? So like, did you, so did, were you writing stuff that was like maybe beyond those styles that you wouldn't include? Totally. Like, yeah, okay. some stuff like there was, there was one that was like, I remember when we were like getting together for the second album and there was one that, that it was like so polarized. It was like, okay, what's the hardest part? And then what's the catchiest part? And I had like the whole vocal worked out. And I showed it to Pete and like the look on his face was amazing. Cause he, he just looked like, like you're expecting me to eat a shit sandwich right now. Like there's no way in fucking hell. And, and the way he repeated back to me, what I said sounded so embarrassing. Like I can remember, <laughs> like, like he looked at me and he's like, Oh, what was the line dude? It's like, it, it's not a choice. It's my heart or something like that. And I was like, Oh yeah, never mind, dude. That's terrible. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did that. So like when you, so bring, like when you first started, um, what you were saying right now, you mentioned, um, you mentioned something about, um, not overplaying or not spending too much time on something. So would you say that when, you know, you, you were getting in a room with those fellows or even the 10 yard fight fellows, would you say that like you would, you would feel the energy of what you guys were playing or you want it. So you would know right, right away if it was yes. quote unquote good or not. Yeah. Like if it didn't like, perfect example was like like patterson chris patterson had the like the main part of hardcore pride and then we wrote around like that main just super simple killing time sounding part and i remember like him playing me those chords and being like dude that's it like for real like that's that's so minimalist and then when it came together right away it was like oh that's awesome i think a lot of it is like also working with like what the other people want to play. Cause if they're not having fun, 
what's the point? Like there would, there would be certain things where, where with Luke specifically, where I could tell, like, that's not in his wheelhouse. Not, not that he can't play it. It's just, it's not fun for him. So it's going to drag the whole thing down. And it, I think it also makes people self-conscious in a way like there, you just want to be able to like bang it out. But yeah, I, I, I think it was like mainly that just like everyone had to enjoy it or else like there were songs we dropped because we were just like this, this isn't fun to do. <laughs> sure. I mean, you, you have to, um, you have to write around the strengths um, of the people you're playing with. Um, sorry to interrupt you. Zach. go ahead. No, no, no. I just think that it's a good time to like say that it's important to jam, you know, because like there's the people, there's always the people in bands that aren't like the contributors, you know, they're not writing songs and stuff, but they're still important in a way that they shape things by, you know, just simply saying like, Oh, that's dope. Or maybe you can tell that when you're jamming, like they play that song a little harder or you can tell Absolutely. like, okay, they don't really like this song as much. Like it gets to you. And so like, even when you're doing these bands where there's like usually two dudes, like pushing like the project forward, like the other people in the band at the time really do shape the project. Agreed. hundred percent. Anthony, when you, when you guys are making the hardcore pride seven inch, like one thing I think about that record is like every song has intent and no song really sounds like any other song on the record. Was that intentional? I think so. Like, making that record was kind of like making well first of all it's like it's our second recording together so we could be a little more intentional but it, but it was like very like all the songs every working title was just whatever it was inspired by and mosh so like west coast mosh work boot mosh like they all had just like <laughs> mosh working titles because they were all like an homage to something we liked like you know like i said like killing killing time raw deal or uniform choice and yeah, it was almost like, cause we didn't think it was going to even then like going to go anywhere. So it was like, it didn't seem daunting to not daunting, but it didn't seem like a bad idea to just be like, let's just make a mixtape through our lens of like all the shit we like, you know, without, except for like, there was some stuff that was like more blasty or um, cheater beat sort of like phonetic on the demo that we had dropped because we just, I don't know, like a lot of bands were doing that at the time and it just seemed like a little too intentionally amateur or something. I think there would have been a way to do it cooler, like a straight ahead or something. But at that time it was like, that that was the only like guardrail, like just don't do that, like super blasted out brotherhood style, even though we covered brotherhood later. Man, it's, <laughs> it's funny because um, I, I, Zach, I'm really curious to hear your your opinion on this because you know, we got into hardcore a lot at the or we got into a lot of hardcore at the same time. I never had any problems with the cheater beat. And I think it's because I loved Chain of Strength so much. But as I continued to stay into hardcore and meet people, the cheater beat had a really bad reputation. Do you like or dislike the cheater beat? Well, we gotta we gotta specify, right? There's two different <laughs> cheater beats. And I think that Tenured Fight did use the one that you're referring to, like the chain yeah. of strength. He he wasn't yeah. doing double time on the hi hat, right, Pops? So on Hardcore Pride, they do because Ryan plays drums. Okay, so that was like that was like a, a totally different thing too. But yeah, because because Ben had sort of learned from Ken Olden, and Ken Olden is a notorious cheater. So, yep. <laughs> that, the, one of the, that, dude, like maybe the most notorious to the point. Todd, do you remember Papa Draza used to call that beat the DC cheat? Dude, I don't, but that's incredible. <laughs> Because that battery record is like the most blatant example of that cheat beat. It, it, it is, and yeah, Ben Ben did that beat. I think on that on that one tune off the demo that um, it started off real slow and then had a fast part at the end. Time mm -hmm. the name it, it escapes me, but I yeah, but yeah, I yeah. never I never had a problem with that. But I know a, a lot of folks like it's a very polarizing beat for sure. But hey, what's the second cheater beat? Okay, so the scissor beat. The other one. Oh, so it's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So that that's the one he's talking about where like straight ahead uses it on the very fast shit. Right. And going back to negative effects uses it. That one can be great if it's used sparingly. You know, floor punch does it well, you know, on the short yeah. tracks when they do it. But it's it has to be used like getting in and getting out because there used to be like a shit ton of crusty bands in the 90s that would use that for like their fast beat and be using it like their entire two minute fast song. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It would just be like, dude, get the fuck out of here. What is this? You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, you're you're totally right, Zach. That's uh Floor Punch did it on that song Shotzi, and and that in and the fast part in that song is more of like a uh, 
it, it doesn't serve as like a vo- or as a verse or a chorus. It kind of serves as like a, I, I don't know if this is the right word, but like a just kind of a, a spastic fast part, like a, a, like based around an energy. Yeah, I mean, not for me has it too, right? That's true. Like, the first song was seven inch. They so I mean, like they know how to use it properly, like get in and out. Also, like it has to be recorded well, right? So you have to have the hi hat be kind of low in the mix because if it's really high, then it cuts it up more. And you, what you want is you want the snare to come through that like you're playing something very fast. Not to like belabor this, but but I, one thing that's like reminding me of is like at that time coming out of like so many like Snap Casian bands, it was sort of like a badge of honor to play a real fast beat. Like there just weren't a lot of bands. Like if yeah. you look like contextually, like there weren't a lot of bands playing that or they would be doing sort of like a more driving mid tempo. So maybe to a fault, like discarding that scissor beat was, was totally to be like our drummer can play a real fast beat, dude. And that's rare. You know, like that's how funny or maybe small that time was where, where like you would take note, like you would, you would judge other bands just on the drummer's fast beat alone. And that like, that actually started my infatuation with drums was like how, like how those nuances impact everything. And like, and then it just totally opened up like this nerd world of like playing behind the beat or playing like a slower fast beat or like why the fast beat sounds different on the burn seven inch. And you know that, but, but it really was like, at least like in this like small East coast enclave, like the, the tiers of bands were sort of by drummer in a way. <laughs> Dude, that's 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 such a good point because Ryan Patterson was a slam and drummer. Mark uh, Kingshot was a slam and drummer. And if you take it back a couple of years forward, whoever played drums in Right Brigade was good, and whoever and and both drummers in Count Me Out were extremely good. I thought um, that's interesting. Yeah, and dude, I still judge bands by the drummer. <laughs> you know, what I mean, like if your drummer is yeah. sorry, your band is sorry, and. For stuff like if if you dabble in like the D beat and the more raw punk side, like that is critical of having a good drummer. So like there was that record from last year, the Destruct LP, and the drumming yeah. on that is so good. It carries the whole record and like it makes them like a fabulous band where if they just had like a basic ass drummer, I don't know, it might be a basic ass record, but who knows? Like the drumming drives it so hard that it's like, God damn, this is good. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm not Ta- like the most like uh well-versed converged person but like aren't there kind of like two distinct eras there's like the damon era and then i forget the fellow who's played on like the majority like he's just such a insane and different drummer and like that's the modern like that's not even modern that's like the legacy version of converge right yeah I, i'm not familiar with the names of the folks i am a huge converge fan but yeah ben um ben, ben from yeah. converge now since since i think like 2000 is i mean he's like yeah he's the base he's the base the foundation of that band is his drumming is phenomenal uh you know the, those guys i've heard stories about them going to play like you know those european metal fests and they'll have people like pepper keenan and and kirk from crowbar like standing right next to ben just watching him play drums for the whole set and like kind of you know having a good time watching him play drums can, can i ask something like the converge thing i wanted to talk to you about working with Kurt because this, this whole thing's like kind of a trip with me when, you know, when we, when we were doing bands in the nineties, there was this like, I don't, wouldn't even say silent rivalry between Brian and Kurt. And I mean, I don't feel bad like airing it out. Like Brian would be like, Oh, Kurt sucks, dude. Like don't work with him. And like, obviously that's not true. And I always felt like not ever having worked with Kurt, I wouldn't understand what that relationship is like and why people enjoy recording with him just that whole experience. Cause I only had one, basically like one recording experience, which could be like tenuous at times. Um, and, you know, doing the record, like one, I feel like a lot of people like the maybe producers get a little less shine than they should now. And yeah, I'm just, I'm just like curious of like that working relationship and why you enjoy working with him and, and on this record specifically? Sure. So um, I'll, I'll say this. When I was a teenager in my 20s and probably in my 30s, I was an asshole. So like to hear Brian say that, it's like I, I understand he was probably also in his 20s, but that's kind of disappointing. But, you know, it is what it is. But, uh, well, Zach will understand this a lot. You know, when when we were starting our hardcore bands and, and going out to do recordings, you know, we didn't have access to a lot of folks or a lot of audio engineers who 
would likely understand our references of the bands that we wanted to sound like or the, or the sounds that we wanted to achieve in our own recordings. And so when, when Carry On you know, got linked up with, with Bridge Nine, we were excited about American Nightmare in the way that they were going to, you know, they were going to Kurt, but, but Kurt really made them sound explosive. Like Kurt gave them like a really proper, like, I don't, I, I the lack of better word, like professional recording that still sounded explosive for a hardcore band. So because we had that in through bridge nine, carry on, went to go record with them. And it was cool. We did our thing with Kurt. I think the record sounds good. I thought it sounded good. Then um, Kurt had developed his style. And I really enjoy his um, the way that he's able to record a drum sound. Um, his drums have this style that sound like you're at a show. They sound very live and, and, and acoustic. And then, um, you know, when I was doing nails, I wanted to to use, you know, the, the HM2 pedal. And he had experience recording bands with HM2 pedals. So I, I went to him. He was like the guy who was doing like this fear records and then that band trapped them like he made them sound awesome i mean they, they sounded good anyway but um he was it just turned tur- i don't want to say it was a coincidence because i did have a very good working relationship with him with a with a, with the history um so it was one of those things where it would be easy for me to say like oh i want to go make a record oh i could just call kurt and i know it's going to sound awesome but you know again he did have like a very good experience with um, he knew how to record bands with that HM2 pedal. So that was really the main reason why we chose them. But, um, but, but that's why carry on chose them in, in the beginning, because, you know, there, there are some recording engineers who, who did good work, but like, you know, me and Zach were, uh, I don't know, Zach, did, does that, re- do you relate with what I said earlier about that, where there wasn't a whole lot of audio engineers that could get exactly what we wanted in California at that time? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, if you think about where we started recording with John Lyons at the living room, you know, we'd record and he'd go, how do you like that? And you'd either say, I liked it or you didn't. And uh, We'll do it again. But he would never tell you that was pretty good. You know, like, I don't think I ever got a compliment from him and respect, right? It like shaped us to, to play better, I think, you know, but even coming out of that, yeah, it's like Paul Miner was good and he had some references, but he hadn't settled into his own studio at the time, really. And other than that, yeah, there wasn't a lot. Like that dude we went to for the In Control LP, I can't even remember Jeff his Forrest. name. Yeah, Jeff Forrest. Like he he didn't fucking know anything. And so like, yeah, you did the carry on record there. But like you've always been way more intentional and kind of know what you're doing better than me. So like that 7-inch came out pretty good. Ours is just like a fucking mess. So like. I don't know. I, I think we just thought, okay, Unbroken did it there. Uh, we can do it there. And I think Overnight a Body went there too. So, but yeah, like he did. He didn't know shit about hardcore. Yeah. So, I, Anthony, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> no, totally. I mean, the the other thing, and maybe it's just because it's I've been listening to it recently and not going back to the older material as much. But on this record, there's you, you mentioned like that acoustic drum sound. I think it's like such a amazing contrast to the guitars, which like the only thing I haven't heard anyone point out, and I could be way off base in sort of like everything I've been reading and comment skimming is there's this like very not blown out, but like in almost industrial nature to the guitar, even though it's, it's not like that uh, syncopated, but it's like, there's a super interesting contrast between the guitar tracks and the drums. And I don't know if that's something you could talk about or something like you and Kurt specifically focused on, but, but to me, like that creates all the depth in the recording. So there's, so so I would say um, there's two things. Number one, um, when the way that nails got our sound um, at Kurt's was, you know, we went to go record our unsilent death record there. And the way that he mixed it is he put all, he put the guitars at the front of the mix and put all the other instruments a little bit below the guitars. And, I think that's like a key reason. And that's something we stuck with. That's something we have replicated throughout every mix that we've done is that we want the guitars very, very, very upfront in the mix. So they're very loud. And um, I think that's a big part of why our records sound the way they do. And then, uh, and then another thing, which I think lends itself to your, um, to your question about like the industrial sounding thing, we, we split our guitar signal 
so we, you know, we, we had an HM2 going to like a Marshall amp, but then we split our guitar signal to a, um, a boss metal zone and then plug that directly into the board, which provided like a very high end sizzle to mm -hmm. the guitar sound, which is something we did on our second record, Abandon All Life. And I wanted to get like that kind of feeling, like that sizzle, that kind of like scrapiness. I wanted to have that same effect on this record because that's my favorite guitar tone that Nails has done. So sick. Yeah, let's let's jump in a little bit because I've listened to this record a bunch since it's come out. And I think it's sick, dude. Todd, I think that one thing you're doing on this record a little more is maybe you brushed by it about like kind of settling into things. And I think it's really there on that first song the imposing will like the way that you flip that final like mid-tempo riff like into that bounce riff and kind of milk it a thing mm -hmm. about nails in the past has kind of been you hit like a sick ass riff and then you move on it kind of seems like you can settle into something on this record a little better than before yeah i don't i don't want to use the word fisher price because i use that to describe bands that i think are like um like like you know haven't matured yet but it's 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 simplicity I wanted it to be kind of simple and I don't mean that in a bad way. It, it, that That's what kind of lends itself to b being catchy. At least that's what I've, I've taught myself. That's what I, that's what I try to do. There are some, some risks taken on this record. You know, in the past you've done like the big slow songs, which have kind of been like the, the big moments on certain records, but here the end of, first of all, the beginning of every bridge burning is so sick, how slayered out it is. And that drum fill is ridiculous, like going into it. But, uh, the end part is very rocking. And then coming out of like that rocking in part going into give me the painkiller, which is like a full on rocker song. That's kind of new for nails. Do you think like that style? Yeah. Well, I was very nervous because I, when you, when, when I first sent you the record, um, we were having a conversation about, um, just like other hardcore music. And, and you had mentioned that, um, like the kind of like motorcycle influence punk was, was not your favorite. And, um, I was like, fuck dude, Zach's not going to like, like my favorite <laughs> song on this record, which is okay. I don't need you to like everything I do, but it's like, damn, like this is like one of the first people I'm sending this record to. And like, I'm, I'm going to, you know, because if you don't like something, you're like pretty quick to just like, you're just on honest. You're a very honest person. Um, but yeah, so like that was, you know, that's influenced by like Judas Priest and like Motorhead. And um, I've said this before, but like um, during COVID, like one of the things that, that helped me get out of like a writer's block was just simply um, learning Van Halen songs. I would not say anything on the Nails record is necessarily influenced by Van Halen, but like one of the things that I got out of Eddie Van Halen's guitar playing is just how expressive he is and how how like all the time he's just doing something different. And um, and I just thought to myself, hey, you know, that would be a fun and inspiring thing for me to try out is to be a little bit more expressive in my own guitar playing because like you know, man, you you've known me for a very long time, like. You know, I could, I, I've been able to play hardcore since I've played in hardcore bands. And that's because when I was learning how to play guitar, I was learning Nirvana songs, Metallica songs, and Slayer songs. So I picked, I, by the time I was like 15 or 16, I had already picked up like a lot of chops just from like, or a lot of metal chops just from playing like Slayer songs. So hardcore wasn't like a very necessarily challenging thing for me to play um, with my hands. Um, you know, writing songs is a completely different skill, but I could, I could play the music, right? I feel like I just kind of wanted to go off a little bit more with my hands. Yeah, you do like some pretty wild solos on here, which is sick. And dude, that song, it, it is like, I think maybe what we were talking about before is any like wild band that sticks around long enough kind of ends up leaning towards Motorhead. You know, like if you think about like the anti c uh, Scandinavian Jawbreaker record, this Give yeah. Me the Painkiller is kind of like that on speed, you know, like that song. Um, yeah. In a, in a great way, though. I mean, like it it is very powerful and rocking and gnarly. You know, I, it's not as groovy as like that other stuff. Like it's still very nails. But I just want to say it sets up my favorite song on the record that lacking the ability to process empathy. Good God, man. I, I think it's a top five nails song. And it is so fucking gnarly dude like the verse headbangs and then the chorus is about as catchy as you can get you know and like there's maybe a little bit of uh 25 to life separate ways in there on the chorus and then maybe <laughs> the maybe the final final mosh a little bit of spit on your grave but uh yeah. 
Dude, that's brushing me just where I like it. I mean, this song is the fucking shit. Let me know what you think. Awesome. Yeah, that song. Um, um, yeah, I love that song. Um, that was, I'll, I'll be real honest. Um, like I mentioned before, this record probably has like the least amount, or it absolutely has the least amount of like death metal influence on it. And I was kind of more focused on the punk stuff. So it was very hard. It, it was kind of hard for me to like um, write like a heavier mid tempo song on this record. And I, I think um, I think those riffs came out, and I think they're great riffs. And uh, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I can't say the song was one of my favorites going into the record, but I could say that after we recorded it, I I saw more magic in it, and I was like very much more stoked on it after it was recorded than I was prior to like making it. The prior to the band making it, and then the last two songs on the record again, a little bit of risk taking with D. Excuse me, not maybe the. I don't have the, it right in front of me, but in the back part of the record, uh, the song Dehumanized has like kind of a black metal influence. And then the final song, No More Rivers to Cross. I mean, this is like a stoner metal anthem. Yeah. So so the Dehumanized, like shout out to Shelby. He wrote that song. He wrote all the music in that song and he did a killer job. And then the next song would be um, I Can't Turn It Off, which kind of has more um, in common with uh, Give Me the Painkiller. And then, yeah, the No More Rivers to Cross song. I I was going, we were going for kind of like a Danzig kind of uh, uh, doomy, doomy uh, thing with that song. Like maybe like a Electric Wizard. I don't, I don't know if anybody's going to hear that. In fact, I don't even know if I hear it, but that's what we were going for. Like sometimes you go for something and um, it doesn't turn out the way that you intended it to, but it still, like, it comes out cool. And I think that's what happened with that song. Um, what, one thing, though, like, and I'd like to ask you about this, because I, I did hear feedback, um, I think, from yourself right now. And I've, I've seen it. I've seen somebody else state this is, you know, folks will say that, um, you know, Nails has typically ended um, each record with like a like a slow, drawn out song. Um, you know, I, I and on this one that we didn't. And um, that's something that I kind of don't really understand because I, I feel like that's what I, or I'll say this, maybe the intent isn't being felt, but that's what we were trying to do on this one. I do feel like that song is like kind of like a downer, sludgy, doomier song, but maybe, uh, maybe we didn't um, achieve that vibe and maybe, maybe it's not felt and that's okay. I think it's like, the big crescendo of the record. Right. But it is like, it's yeah, a different. If it's, it's a different style than what you normally attack. It's not like a, a big metal song. It's like, I mean, it is metal, but agree. it's a different type of metal. It's not like the crunch. It's like more of like stoner metal, but it's sick because like you can't wipe away like the hardcore sensibility of your band. Like the song still leads up to a final mosh. Right. It's pretty funny. That yeah. Way. You know, you know, you know where I learned how to do that from, dude? Is, is partly from you is you because you you said something years and years and years and years ago and you're like victim and pain is so perfect because you have all these like hard songs at the beginning of the record and then you have the slow you have the slow song at the end and if you don't feel like listening to a slow song you could just turn it off and i was yeah. like man zach's completely right and then i noticed uh, the other band that i noticed that does that was infest and um, that was sort of like the blueprint for like the the sequencing on the nails records that we have done thus far. Um, so I gotta I gotta give my man Zach a shout out for that. Well, much respect, everyone. Nails, every bridge burning uh, came out on Nuclear Blast. Handle business, buy that uh, record, and uh, listen to it on a streaming. Drive up then numbers. All right, pops. I want to get into a project that you worked on recently. You unearthed this uh, early 80s Boston compilation called Prop 4-1. Uh, and it's a bunch of like post-punk bands from the area. It was originally a cassette comp that had some trouble with the quality and never really saw the light of day. Can you give the, a little bit of the background on this thing? Yeah, so the, the label's called Propeller Product. It was basically a DIY label in the early 80s in Boston that these folks uh, operated as a collective and, you know, depending on who you ask, there's different, different takes on whether that was efficient or not. I think they did about seven releases. So it wasn't exactly like a long run, but it wasn't, you know, two, you know, one or two releases. Um, and I, what was interesting about it is like going, you know, growing up in Massachusetts and, 
living in Boston for so long, I'd always been curious about like different sub scenes because of the hardcore scene, even when hardcore wasn't super big, it like dominated the story of Boston music other than like, it's kind of just like Aerosmith and hardcore in a weird way and like morphine or something. And then sort of like the college rock bands were really transient. Like Buffalo Tom would be around for a little bit and the Dam builders and then galaxy 500. And then they just kind of go away. Um, and so I was always like, when I had gotten deeper into music, I was like, there has to be post-punk bands. Like they could, that couldn't have skipped over Boston. And I stumbled upon like what they have two seven inch compilations. And I was, I was drawn to them by the covers because the covers, it looked like something on factory records to me. And so whatever, like years later, I, I met some folks in New York who were familiar with the label and they, one of them had restored this cassette comp and, uh, you know, explained like all the original cassettes had a manufacturing error where that like, I don't know the technical term, but that little felt bumper would fall out and it would make this screeching noise and none of them played correctly. And so it was kind of like a, I don't know, I, I never really intended to start a record label and until like everyone who has a bad backstory, like during COVID, I was <laughs> going, you know, queuing up in front of local record stores to go in for 20 minutes and buy records and then leave safely. And um, I was friends and still am obviously with this guy, Brian Gemp, who runs record grouch in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. And we, he was like, we should, we should do something. We need a project. And I told him, you know, I, I think I could get the originals for this propeller comp. And it just went from there. And it, it kind of, the, the main contact was this guy, Michael, who actually played in, lounge rock act combustible edison and he also won jeopardy for real like a millionaire <laughs> dude. it's pretty amazing like a millionaire genius and he's really just an amazing person and he had referred me to his friend justin who was in the wild stairs and it it took a while but eventually what we found is like a lot of people like gerard cosloy you know who used to do conflict fanzine and then you know matador he was really invested in it. And then Bob Weston from Shellac was really invested and he ended up mastering it. And um, yeah, it was just really, there was something fun about this idea of like giving something that was overlooked, like a proper release and and getting it out in a way that no one had heard it. Um, So that's really it. Like it's, I, I think the most interesting thing maybe to listeners who haven't fallen asleep yet is that like this was going on in tandem with the hardcore scene, like they're playing Gallery East and The Rat and a lot of the same venues with SSD Control, with DYS. And like the song, How Much Art is about the propeller product scene. And there's like a demo version of How Much Art where they say something about the wild stairs. And, and Al Burrell's, you know, talked about how he wanted to do a band basically the opposite of those like arts artsy bands or whatever. So that was kind of the draw to me. And, and, you know, just for myself, like it's a compilation. So I'm not going to, you know, different songs are going to, it's, it's pretty wide spectrum of music from like power pop to um, like almost avant noise with still with drums. And, you know, the stuff I gravitate to is like the pretty progressive bands like V and, um, and the wild stairs and dangerous birds, dangerous birds being more tuneful, but I like how uh, just like, you know, the band V V semicolon, um, it's just, you know, it's in line with like early gang of four and like the, you know, second PIL record. So the, those are like some of my favorite bands. So it's like really a kind of a dream project to do this. And then we have some other things in the works that are in the same construct, like releasing music that was never released properly the first go round. Yeah. That V band was my favorite on here. Uh, that itch Lieb song. What, however yeah. you pronounce that that song is so cool and the singer has a fabulous voice i also like that white women song um mm-hmm. it's short cool and rocking it's like a i think it's a two minute or maybe a, even a sub two minute song and that's mm-hmm. the only band on there i believe that has a single song so i wish there was another but yeah this is cool who who would you say like this is for pops if you like this you'd like this yeah i i think it's more of like if you're into the idea of 
hearing something that you didn't know existed, like a Boston post-punk scene sort of other than Mission of Burma. Like, who are the bands that played with Mission of Burma? That would be the hook because also it just didn't work out. But Roger Miller from Burma has said like that propeller cassette was a small Bible to me. And um, he has a lot of reverence for it. And there was a whole a whole club scene in Boston or um, this club, the underground in Alston, where it was one of the only clubs that Joy Division was going to play. Of course, I never played, but The Cure and New Order played there. And it's like a, you know, 150 cap room, which is pretty amazing because it's like this basement club. I don't know what it is now, but just to think of like all the drunk college kids that like pranced around it and didn't know like The Cure were playing. That alone is pretty interesting to me. But I would say anyone, you know, into, you know, post-punk, um, maybe like Delta Five, bands like that, I think, um, yeah, it's worth checking out, but also just the historical value of of sort of like the yin to hardcore's yang or however that would work, you know. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, I was going to say if I think uh, like hardcore folks who are interested in like the DC Revolution Summer stuff would 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 definitely find something they liked here. I mean, I, I did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's sick. Uh, Pops, another tie-in would be the first Negative Effects show, right? Do you want to tell that brief story of how like these two scenes crossed? Yeah, so. Well, I think it's Dangerous Birds played the last Burma show, which is one of the, you know, like the infamous negative effects riot. So, I mean, that's a pretty, and and Dangerous Birds was a band with, uh, it was one of Talia Zedek's first projects. And Talia is like a prolific artist still releasing and recording interesting music and like pretty amazing roster of, of anything from like more, sort of straightforward rock bands to avant music with Uzi come. Um, and they just reissued all the come material or most of the come material recently. Uh, but yeah, I mean that, that whole show, like, you know, Burma wanting, Bur- I don't think people understood like how influenced by hardcore Burma was. Um, and they even said like, even though they weren't changing the styles of songs, it, it changed how they played their songs and played them with more attack. And even, you know, if you listen to the song Peking Spring, which is one of the earliest recordings, um, there was a breakdown in that song that was influenced by hardcore and which, you know, you wouldn't probably pick up on at first. And so for them to like play their last show and they wanted negative effects, because that's what was that was the new thing to them, you know. <laughs> so, and, <laughs> and, and you know, it ends in a riot and, I, you know, there's pretty good footage of it from one of the, you know, super well produced Tang VHS comps but but it is out there but yeah that that's that's all pretty interesting the other thing too is like if uh if anyone's a fan of magnetic fields the band white wild stairs was a big influence and <clears throat> excuse me um some of the folks involved with the comp went on to be in uh susan anway was in magnetic fields and magnetic fields covered a wild stairs song so there's kind of like that tie in as well. It's, it's pretty, it's, it's definitely all over the map, but then also, you know, there's, there's songs by like art yard and the neats that are just pretty straightforward, almost like pubby power pop. I would say. What year did you get into that comp? This one I didn't get into until maybe 10 or 12 years ago because I had never heard it, but I had gotten the singles when I was still in Boston and I was just buying like, you know, that was like a time where, nothing used unless it was on the wall was over 10 bucks. So that fit my, like, I would just, I wouldn't even bother putting used records on in the store. Like if it looked cool enough, I I can gamble four or five bucks. And I think like all those singles were like two bucks at the time. Like, you know, I, I I was a big local bin digger because they used to have those at every store. And that, that was like the most ignored bin because the most, like the obvious stuff would be gone. And then you'd just be left with these things and kind of looking at them like, like I remember buying stuff thinking like that's probably hardcore and it would just be like total like shitty new wave or something, but the cover was blown out. So like, eh, maybe it looks like someone's screaming, you know? Um, but yeah, I got into those comp, the, the two seven inch comps when I was in Boston. So, you know, like mid nineties. Dude pops. I totally bought a seven inch like that once. The band was called like atomic 51 or some bullshit. And it had a yelling dude on the front. Yeah, I know the one. You're, I know that exact cover. I was for like, sure. "Oh, this record sucks." Well, my two bucks back. Uh, Todd, what did you like off this? I I listened to it like when you sent the link about an, an hour before the um, 
the, the conversation. So I didn't have a time to really dig into it, but I did like how expressive everything was. It, it to me, it did sound a lot like, uh, like some of the discord record stuff, the revolution summer stuff, or it's like circus lupus, um, just really angular, interesting, melodic guitar. It's very, very, very guitar driven, or at least the first couple of songs I heard on it. Um, I'm definitely going to dive into it and, uh, which I'm looking forward to, but, uh, it's super interesting stuff for sure. You know, I'd be, be remiss not to mention that like for the time period, this was recorded, like there, there's a huge amount of diversity with all the bands that were part of the label. And there's like a lot more uh, representation of women and queer folks that, than really typical to the era. And I think that alone is like pretty, pretty interesting too. It's, it's still kind of a mind blower to me that more people don't know about it. And Fuck you to every capital F to every Boston media person I reached out to who ignored my emails. I know you're going to hear this. That's Go fuck funny. yourselves, people. What's going on? Regarding this comp, do you think, or, or that's okay. Regarding the comp, regarding mm-hmm. the scene of bands that are on the comp, do you think that has more, like, more um, to, more in common with, like, um, like the New York City, like Andy Warhol, like, uh, like artsy kind of, like, like, uh, indie music that that was going on in the late 70s totally yeah yeah totally like analogous to no wave and and like i mean another yeah another peg would just be sonic youth like they were champions of a lot of the bands and like collaborated with some of these artists too so i think i think it's like definitely more that lane and and the other thing too is like all the all the folks i've talked to for the most part you you know you think they're doing well not you think like you're listening to what they're doing and it's pretty artsy and like boundary pushing, but they all loved hardcore too. And that's not like me, like making a hype sticker. It's, it's like interesting to talk to these folks who are, you know, in their sixties or whatever and talking about how, like it was all punk to them. Like they were actually kind of like, why doesn't SSD like us? Like we're punk too. And I, and I, I think that just speaks to, I mean, I guess we're in a time where everything's kind of, it's like wide and homogenized at the same time now. And it's not as weird that, people listen to all different stuff. But back then, like these two things that would seem so polar opposite were still kind of the same thing because everything was so small. Yeah. yeah. The new thing is also wiping out the old thing too, right? So it's it's easier to be like the older kids on the block and wanting to be inclusive with the new kids compared to the new kids just want to wipe the old shit out and start something new. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, everyone, we will link this up in the uh, show notes so you can buy it. Also, it's on streaming, so handle business. It is Prop 4-1, and uh, yeah, check it out. Okay, finally, I just wanted to touch base on a project that I am working on. Bob Wilson and I, uh, he is of FYA and Rebirth Records fame. We're working on a scene report fanzine called 185 Miles South of Somewhere. And basically what we're doing is we're compiling scene reports from all over the country and the world. So we've gotten a bunch of sick shit already. And by the time this airs, it'll be even more filled out. We're hoping to get around a hundred ish, hopefully, but uh, yeah, we got a lot of sick shit already. We got uh, Buenos Aires. We got Belgium. We got Cambodia. We got Dubai. We got Iran. We got Tijuana, we got Nepal, we got Portugal, we got Serbia, you know, and then of course we got a bunch of shit from all over uh, the States, you know, um, a bunch in California, Indiana, Montana, a couple New York, Tennessee, you know, we're going to fill this out. It's going to be sick. And also we're going to do a little cassette compilation along with it. That's going to lean very international. Most of the shit is already out. It's kind of like a, a dream time to do comps if you don't care about stuff already being released just because there's so much shit up on Bandcamp and you can kind of just go through and choose your favorite stuff, you know, and uh, so many releases are just digital now and they're not finding any sort of physical release. So it'll be sick to to rescue some of this stuff from uh, the digital purgatory and put it down at least on uh, a, a physical format. So cassette, I don't want to wait a year to do a record. And uh, that's that. So everyone check it out. Uh, keep your eyes peeled to the uh, 185 socials and I will keep you all updated for when that comes out because I'm going to need to sell some because printing is expensive. And if we're talking 100 pages plus, this shit could be a fucking nightmare if I don't sell any. <laughs> so what's up? I'm super curious to hear what a band from Iran sounds like or a band from Dubai. That's super fucking mm-hmm. interesting to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's sick that uh, 
people are doing it everywhere. You know what I mean? So I don't know. Hardcore's worldwide and there's like beautiful things about the internet and there's fucking dog shit things about the internet. And you know, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the beautiful thing is like, it can connect everyone, you know? And it's like, you can be like a dude isolated in like a small town in Iran where it's like, you can't put on punk shows, but you can still be like an individual that like rides for your shit. And you know, put stuff out on SoundCloud or whatever. Like that is so ill. If you can figure out how to like record yourself, you do it. And you know, you can put on underground shows and stuff. It's funny when like, you know, you always see barnacles talking about like, well, back in my day, you'd see someone in a punk shirt and like you, you feel it, it would feel like it's special. Right. And like, Oh, but nowadays everyone's into punk. It's like, that's not really true, dude. I ride my bike like almost every day out at like the boardwalk in PB and mission beach. And it's like, this is full on beach culture, tourist shit. And I never see people in punk shirts. You know what I mean? Like once in a while I'll see a dude in a bad religion shirt and I'll say, what up? You know what I mean? But like, it's still relatively underground and, and it's sick anytime that people are into it. And I don't know, it's just sick that it's worldwide. Like, I think that we can never, we can never lose sight of that. And anytime that you feel like, a piece of hardcore or a piece of punk has like completely jumped the shark and feels like it's dead. There's always like another pocket you can find that's interesting to like, so you don't lose it. Right. Cause other people are going to lose sight of like the glory of punk and hardcore, but you don't have to. So when you get blown out on like some part, you just like find another nook that you love and like rekindle that fire inside yourself. You know what I mean? And don't end up being like a sorry ass dropout that hates everything you once were. That shit is weak. Um, yeah, I agreed. Hell yeah. Okay, let's get into some new stuff. Um, I want to just run down a few things that we're not going to dive into, but I wanted to shout them out. Uh, first of all, the Gum Scab Cut Your Teeth EP. This is a band out of Portland, Maine. I enjoyed it. Uh, Coffin, Jesus Christ, I hope I pronounce this right. Uh, Coffin Vicars, they put out an LP called Curses and Prayers. Uh, it's really good post punk death rocky shit. So check that out. Uh, the Illiterates, this is that band that uh, sounds like Youth of the Day can't close my eyes, but they're punk as fuck. Uh, they put out a tour tape in 2024. It is so sick. And they did a CCR cover that actually they don't <laughs> rank it. It's pretty sick, dude. It came out good. Uh, Got to yeah, yeah, you got to check it. And then also, uh, finally, a band called Rough Puff. Their uh, demo 2024, I enjoyed it. And then finally, finally, uh, oh, yeah, the False Salvation demo. This is a uh, dude, friend of the pod and Philly uh, hardcore mosh legend, Kevin Hare. His uh, band, it came out on Rebirth Records. So, uh, dude, Rebirth Records, just like Dan Santon trivia, they don't miss. So handle business and get that. Okay. Let's get into it. The first record that I wanted to talk about was uh, a band called Thought Control out of New Jersey. They put out a seven inch called Sick and Tired of the Talking Heads. It came out on Crew Cuts in the UK. And apparently a cassette came out on the Demo Listen uh, label here in the US, but it looks like it might be sold out. So uh, check that out. Dude, shoot them an email and bug them and tell them to do another press. What's up? That's real good, by the way. I love that shit. Dude, hell yeah. Okay, before I puff this record up, I do want to give one giant knock on it. Uh, I bought the 7-inch, and it didn't come with a lyric sheet. What the fuck, dude? It's 2024. <laughs> Put a lyric sheet in. You know what I mean? Dude. And also, like, it drives me crazy that bands don't take the effort to put their lyrics up on Bandcamp. You know, and so, like, this band doesn't have a lyric sheet in the record, and the lyrics aren't on Bandcamp. And it's like, dude, I want to know what you're singing about. Like it matters. Even if like you're an angry, straightforward band, like it still matters because a lot of the lyrics on this record are very clever in a way I love the most. Like if you listen to like, I mean, I guess all the retaliate shit, like I lean very smooth brain on a lot of stuff. And this dude like has a very similar mentality with a lot of the lyrics. And I just don't want to know what they are, dude. Cause I love this shit. And unless you're trying to be like the roots, hardcore version of torture, like, you know, that's fucking, you got to put your lyrics out, dude. You know, or are you trying to be a lyric free band? I don't know what's going on here. Um, also, sick and tired of the talking heads, like the uh, the album title. We just got to say, dude, Psycho Killer, sick ass song. So uh, 
Great yeah, song. Yeah, sick and tired Big of all talking the talking heads. heads. <laughs> yeah, dude. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so getting into it. This is the third 7-inch from this band. They did two previous 7-inches in the year 2000 and the year 2002. Uh, they play like a straight forward roots hardcore style. Like, you know, dude, you get like the same name checks on all this stuff, right? They sound like government warning, uh, direct control, but maybe this is like a tad meaner. Maybe there's a little bit of like 86 mentality or Boston Strangler in here. And then also like for some of the mid tempo stuff, maybe they're pulling a little bit of like the, the stuff that straddles the UK 82 and oi shit, like maybe the partisans, um, this is my favorite seven inch of theirs by far. Like it's not even close. And the other two were good. This is fabulous. Um, the first one sounds like it was a, a good, like one dude demo project. And the second one is a lot better, but the singer does that like modern hardcore trope of either having like way too much vocal distortion on it, or he's cupping the mic. And I got to say this, and we've been singing this from the mountaintops for a while, so I'm going to keep saying it. Like, if you're playing, like, this straightforward, like, zero bullshit style of hardcore, like, don't blow it by, like, being a muffly bike guy. You know, like, you don't want to be the shy, muffly bike guy. Like, just (laughs) roll out with your voice. Like, this dude sounds sick. So, this record, there's less of that, and he sounds fucking awesome, you know? And on that second record, he's a little bit of, like, a muffly boy. So this is way better. Um, I also want to say like that stigmatism LP from last year was like the best LP of the year uh, voted on by 185 listeners. And I agree. I voted for that record too. And I just want to say like this seven inch is that good. Like if there was a couple more songs on this record and they put it on a 12 inch, it straight up might be LP of the year uh, in my eyes. So that's that. But also like it is maybe sicker than a seven inch and you're going back to like the early eighties, like pre victim and pain shit when like the best hardcore records were on seven inch, you know, antidote, the abuse, the minor threat, seven inches, negative approach, IQ 32, like that stuff. But, uh, this year has had so many great roots, hardcore seven inches. We've talked some of the really good ones on the pod, like the collateral seven inch, the massacred seven inch, the problem seven inch, and this one, and this one might be my favorite of all of them. Um, I'm going to dive into the songs after, but Pops, what do you think? Overall thoughts on this? Yeah, so the the first thing, like, I was doing my intel, and I thought, oh, they're, the cover reminds me of mental abuse right away. And then, <clears throat> like, not in a bad way. I was like, that's cool, because I kind of like how fucked up that cover looks and the font choices. And then I started listening to it, and I was, you know, all those bands were, were coming through that you mentioned. Definitely not Sham 69 that I think a blurb mentioned. So that was deceiving. And then <laughs> I was like, I think, I think this is what Tear It Up sounds like. Maybe not. Um, and then what, what I like the most, speaking to hookiness, is that there was like a bit in every song. And we can get into the songs later. But like some of the stuff was, was like pretty, like not super obscuro demo core. Like there's a minor threat moment. There's a California Uber Alice moment. There's a bullshit justice moment. And without like, um, but doing it in, you know, like in an homage style, there's like a cool, like sireny sounding lead. that's like very like West coast hardcore to me. So yeah, I mean, it was just one of those records where like every song had some type of rhythmic or, um instrumental hook that kept me invested and in, you know it just super steady and you know, i i would never call a hardcore record easy listening but it was easy for me to just keep like putting it on repeat and just cycling through it and and feeling like like i knew the record really quick which i love yeah it's fabulous like they walk that line between being an aggressive hardcore record and being really catchy like perfectly what do you think todd I think it's an awesome hardcore record. It, you know, just it's, you mentioned this. It sounds like you know the, the 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 typical things you would you would track it back to, like negative approach. Um, I thought the uh, the vocals were the shining diamond on it. I, actually, for stuff like this, it's not so much about it's not so much about the riffs. It's about the execution. Like it, it's about the tone of the voice. It's about the production. Because um, this is like very meat and potatoes hardcore. And it's hard to do great and it's easy to fail at. But this this 
if it's a one man band, he got it, man. He he fucking got it. It's really good. Dude. Yeah, it's just he has like a hook in every song, like that first song, the social suicide, nobody cares. And then that second one, like the five four, you're gonna die. Whatever he says. I can't tell what he's saying, but like there's a hook there. And I love on the third bar of that second song when he just goes, Shut the fuck up. <laughs> like these are the little <laughs> these are like the little things that like I'm like, dude, this is so fucking sick. Like he can go full smooth brain and like just knock it out of the park. And then also on that, that song, like just a dumb motherfucker, you know, like that's what I'm looking for, dude. Like so Absolutely. much of like great, simple, not simple, but stripped down roots. Hardcore is like connecting to like that original rage that you had in your teens that you don't know how to express. You know what I mean? And like this dude lyrically is able to do it. And it's, probably done the best on the third song which is my favorite like the full of shit song like it starts so perfect right he's just like your and then it kicks in da, 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 full of shit it's like yes you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah like that is everything i'm looking for in a straightforward zero bullshit hardcore song and like when it comes back around to that part again the second time and like starts doing the da 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 da, da, da full of shit it's like dude almost every time I've heard it, I've pumped my fist. You know what I mean? And I'm just a dude like listening to it by myself. You know what I mean? Whether I'm on my bicycle or I'm in my truck or whatever, like when that part comes in, that part comes in, I'm just like, God damn dude, let's do this. And then uh, it's wild because like, there's no tempo change until the fourth song, but like mm-hmm. it isn't throwaway fast core bullshit. Like, it's not because there's a hook in every song, you know what I mean? So you get that tempo change though, finally in the fourth song. And then it sets up that fifth song nicely, which is like the mid tempo banger, the sick and tired of the talking heads. And that's the one with like that nice little, like two note lead that pops was calling out and dude, it's so sick. And then finally that song number six, the again on the chorus, like the fuck you, I don't care. Like, again, this is just like, you're tapping into that 16 year old shit that it's like, done so well because it's an art to be able to tap back into that like most people when you get a little older you lose that fire so you get more technical with your songwriting or you get a little more introspective in your lyrics but like when you're doing this like you know straightforward hardcore shit sometimes like you got to figure out how to tap into that stuff and it's a true art i don't know what do you think todd yeah it's it's very it's very hard to do that and to your point what we're saying is like there was a lot of thought put into that like, yeah. like that dude probably spent like that. That wasn't something that he probably just wrote and recorded in a week or even in a month. Like all those things that you mentioned are hooks and they are like, they are witty. They are clever. Um, you might not think that because of the content, but to your point, like that's not easily replicatable and it's fucking, it's, it's, it's smart in its own way. I like the smooth brain bravery. Like there is an art to it in, in yeah. being like, I'm going to take this simple route, but I'm going to do it like whether it's the phrasing, the placement, whatever it like. One thing it made me think of is that in in this world before everyone knew everything before they got to the show, like they know, like down to like the exact moment you're going to stage dive or when like you're getting your like TikTok moment or whatever, you kind of went to a show and you didn't know what to expect. And when you're having songs that by the second time around, I know what's happening. That's really powerful. It was, you know, more of a, a necessity when people were singing along to something that they'd never heard before, you know, and like maybe only knowing it through, through, you know, just by seeing the band live. And I think being able to do that in a recording now without it being like just too like banal is like I said, it's like, it's, it's smooth brain cleverness almost like it's, it's, it's an amazing oxymoron. And that's what like, for me, it's like, if I never knew anything about this band and they played, I would be as pumped as if I was seeing the band. I knew every note because there's like that urgency and that hookiness where I'm, if you got me hooked on one song, I'm there for the whole thing. Granted the sets 12 minutes, I bet, but still whatever. Right. <laughs> yeah. There's also something to be said for like, when you go all the way, This just in, we have breaking news. Let's go to our 185 miles south, well actually correspondent, Ben Merlis, a.k.a. Ben Edge, a.k.a. Bedge, 
who is on location with the details. Thanks, Zach. I'm standing here on top of the sheer cliff known as Prika Stolin, 1,982 feet above Lisa Fjorden in Rogaland County, Norway. And holy fuck, it is freezing cold. The god Thor has bestowed upon this very site the nation's most significant cultural artifact since AHA's Take On Me music video, which hit international airwaves in 1985. I'm talking about the Hardcore Bugs 7-inch EP by Tiebreak on Crucial Response Records, released September 1st, 2024. The same Viking warrior corpsman who back in 1998 laughed us in the fucking face and warned us that sooner or later the kids would fuck our ass are now commandingly declaring, come on, you cunts, give it to me. Or is it, quote, come on, you cocks, give it to me, unquote. It's not like I listened to it 30 times in a row to figure it out. I'm only kidding. I did, in fact, listen to it 30 times in a row to figure it out. Long story longer, back in the late 90s, from the ashes of all the churches their black metal countrymen had burned down, tiebreak X'd up their hands and put out a Better Tomorrow demo and Stand Hard 1998 7-inch EP. Then, somewhere in 2001, according to their bio, quote, the band exploded in a frenzy of fights, alcohol, and unemployment, unquote. I'm just as surprised as anyone else that these guys started boozing it up, but even more surprised that the alleged welfare state from which they hail didn't float them so they could continue pumping out core anthems like another disgrace and not afraid. That brings us to 2024 and the Hardcore Bugs EP I was just holding in my hands a minute ago, but was blown off the cliff from a strong Arctic gale. It was on beautiful baby blue vinyl too. Oh well. Anyway, from what I can recollect, it opens with a total fucking banger, fittingly titled Bang Bang. Vocalist William Oberg, and yes, the O has a line through it, sounds like he has gained 50 pounds and 6 inches and took a diction class. Gone are the days of cupping the mic and shouting unintelligibly. I can make out the words, and he has more of a growl to his voice. Fwens, F-W-I-E-N-D-S, the song Fwens, has cool stops and starts. I'm loud, black hole, and my sense makes sense. Hit hard and are over before you know it. The title track is the weakest song here, even though it reminds me of Body Bag by Rain on the Parade and has a tasty guitar lead going into the breakdown. Maybe it's too self-referential. I get it. You're a hardcore band, so you say the word hardcore a lot. At least these guys weren't bit by the ska bug. Oddly, all of the lyrics were written by outside songwriters, two by someone from the band Haust, and four by the singer of Fair Fuck, who made it into my 1999 Super 7 Honorables. Respect. The final stanza of My Loud, I'm sorry, the final stanza of I'm Loud, written by Fair Fuck Dude, is as follows. Quote, You always come around and nag. Smell my athlete's foot, you old bag. William Shakespeare couldn't have said it any better. Fans of straightforward, late 80s style hardcore songs with breakdowns that clock in at under two minutes with perfect production to match the genre will be duly impressed. Or they'll act like snobs who are dismissive of bands who are named after sports references. I get it. You don't like jocks or some shit. Your loss. Before I cross the Rainbow Bridge and return to Valhalla, aka Los Angeles, California, it's worth noting the record cover depicts Jesus Christ walking out of a cave while holding a tennis racket. Simply baffling. Reporting live from Norway, this is Ben Merlis, a.k.a. Ben Edge, a.k.a. Bedge. We now join our regularly scheduled program already in progress. Like stripped down. If you're going to have like a chorus like fuck you, I don't care or full of shit, like you kind of do have to know what's up with hardcore because – you have to know that that line hasn't already been taken. You know what I mean? So like it's, you're <laughs> right, kind right. of showing right there that you know what's up with hardcore and you've done your homework. You know what I mean? Like, or you're just taking a fucking chance that like the Neos or some shit didn't like already do a song that said, fuck you. I don't care. You know what I'm saying? Like, so mm -hmm. there's that. Okay. Let's jump into the next thing. 
This is the Fatal Realm demo. They're from the Hudson Valley in New York. This was self-released, but you can get it through their band camp. It came out on uh, CDR. So sick. Uh, this is Mike Shaw from Mindforce uh, playing guitar and singing. And Todd, I know you love death metal. I love all that original death metal, but I'm a pretty big poser, like beyond 93, 94. Pops, I don't think we've ever talked about death metal, except one time I think I sent you like a a text message being like, LOL, like, look at this fucking logo. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's blood incantation. <laughs> and I was like, oh, OK, sick. <laughs> so you got a little chops, too. Um, yeah, for me, this demo is so sick because I really only like that, you know, I don't know if Todd, is that the first wave, like the shit you consider, like from death through like 93 ish? Or like, do people consider like the first wave that proto shit like uh, possessed and stuff? Probably first wave is is, is proto what you're talking about. Uh, the okay. Seven churches. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So then I like whatever is like the second wave stuff, right? Or like you know, starting with death and deicide and the first morbid angel and that's my favorite too. Yeah, that's my favorite. Yeah. So like moving, I never really took the ride beyond that, except, I mean, I do love none. So vile. That's like the only record that I really love out of like that original like stuff. Yeah. This thing, like it just touches on all that stuff. I like, you know, it's like deicide mixed with suffocation mixed with like cannibal mixed with death. And then there's like, even like a, like a pestilence esque solo on here. It's five songs (laughs) in nine and a half minutes you can just pump it into my veins, dude. Like it's death metal, but run through like the hardcore sensibility of knowing, like, you know, you don't want any songs that are over three minutes and, uh, it's just in and out. It's like memorable part after memorable part. And, uh, yeah, I fucking love it. What do you think, Todd? I think Mike Shaw is an, uh, an incredibly expressive guitar player. I think he's clever. I don't know if I have the ears for this stuff. How do I elaborate on that? I, I listened to it and it was kind of, it, it was kind of beat downy. Did you get that from it at all? Yeah, and, and that's kind of what I like because I dabble in slam and I know that there's like a slam assance now with like people loving that torture band. So yeah. it, it's kind of sick because they do lean into some slam parts and some like beat downy parts, but I think they're just pulling from like the original shit. Like it seems like they're pulling off that first suffocation LP. Yeah, I, I yeah, that sounds right to me. I I agree. I just I I am so over beat down. Um beat down to me is like candy corn. It's like once you eat your first two or three, it's like all right, this is okay and then you get your fourth or fifth one and you're just like this is fucking terrible. Get this away from me. That's kind of how I feel about beat down. So and and I just want to make it clear. I, I I am not saying anything bad about this band or even Mike Shaw. I have the utmost respect for Mike Shaw. I think he's like I said, I think he's an incredibly expressive guitar player he's sick but it's just it, it's just a simple case of hey th- this 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 genre is just isn't really for me that's all i don't know do you think that you can't appreciate something that's like this stripped down like maybe this is like for someone like me that never like listened to anything beyond 93 i don't know i don't know i mean i i, I <laughs> one thing i did recognize when i listened to it is i thought it was quality like i was like this is good like the vocals are good the riffs are good the drums are good so it's it's un- like when something's good, it's good, r- regardless of whether you like it or not. You know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's like there's objectively good and then there's like subjectively you like it. Yeah, ab- absolutely. So it's it's good, man. It's just, oh, man, just with how popular Beatdown is right now and how like I f- I've just been overexposed to it. It's just like I'm done. Like, it, like <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. All. I think that's I think that's fair. But I, I do think that it works here with the brevity. Right. So like Mike Shaw is kind of like the master of brevity. You know, he pretty, they put out Satisfaction is, is the death of desire. And it's like one of the greatest hardcore LPs of all time. It changed everything and a million bands chased it, but no one ever replicated it. Even Hatebreed, they could never do it again because like they missed that. Like the secret sauce of that record was that all the songs are like sub two minutes. There's such a brevity to it. And that's what makes it great. So like there's nothing that touches that first record. In fact, maybe the closest that anyone ever got was those first two Terra 12 inches. I don't know. So I think that there's something to be said for being able to strip out all the bullshit and just like doing this style with like a brevity because death metal is always like outside of deicide like songs are like four minutes you know what i mean like so kind of bloated 
Yeah. Yeah. So to be able to do these in like a two minute burst is pretty sick. What do you think, Pops? Well, I'm I'm going to come at this from a different angle, but to to speak to what you said and without trying to sound negative, like sometimes when you strip things down, you're getting something stock off the menu at Taco Bell, and then they ran out of sauce. And like, I need the sauce and it's like missing that a little bit. Like this is like, I heard it, it felt like intentionally demoed out in a way that I thought was cool. Like it sounded like it was made in a tinfoil factory. Like the intro so blown out that it's like almost not even a riff. And like, when I say I was coming at it from somewhere different, like I remember the first time I was going to shows in the Hudson Valley and like Poughkeepsie and like, those towns, like you drive through these like idyllic rolling hills and then you, but you know, behind the rolling hills are like an opioid epidemic. <laughs> and like, <laughs> and like <clears throat> yeah. that's what this felt like. Like you get to a club and it's got like a checkered floor and there's a dude in a leather vest, just like pounding Jack and Cokes there. And like, it reminded me of seeing like some band called like, you know, Idle Death or something opening up and you're kind of like, well, one dude has a Strife shirt. Like, I guess they're a hardcore band or whatever. And they just hit you with like a riff of Palooza, which like it just reminded me of like those Hudson Valley, like deathcore kind of checkerboard floor bands, you know, like VFW bands. And to be that being said, like I enjoyed it. It was like a helicopter of riffs descending on me. But like when I say it was missing the sauce is like there was no thread between it. It was like there's an interesting part. There's an interesting part. An interesting part, paddle, 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 beat down riff next. And then when I, I'm like, oh, I'll check out the lyrics. And they're more like blood filled chalices and like stuff I'm not like that into. And so I don't know, like it, it definitely had the vibe of like, I'm writing these riffs for my friends that look like the riffs who just got burnt on a weed deal when you used to get burned on weed deals before it was legal. <laughs> and they're just... They're just taking out their frustration and then we're going to stop at like the worst fast food after and talk about the show, which is totally fucking perfect. Like, that's a pretty amazing. You know what I mean? But as a journey, like I was like, I like this, but I don't know which songs I like because they're kind of like a string of ideas. And I feel like you like Zach, you're saying it's like stripped down, but I would like it stripped down even more. Like just give me two, beat the shit out of me with two ideas and then keep it moving because I feel like if that happened, like I'd die. Like I would, I would be an opioid casualty, which is what I want from this, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I, I don't know. I think that obviously I choose the shit that we talk about on the pod. So like I'm going to like everything, you know, like have you ever looked at the no echo list of like all the shit that comes out every week? Like, oh, yeah. I'm not, yeah, so it's kind of funny. Like, I'm not trying to come off like a homer here and liking everything, but these are like my three favorite things that came out in like the last <laughs> month or whatever. I just, I don't know. I love this thing. I think that he does such a great job of, of using the moshes and hooks, like in that ancient strength song, like circling back to that, that mosh as the hook is, is really good. And, but again, it's like, yeah, I think it's just reminding me of all my favorite death metal shit, right? Like that's very similar to like the the first song off the first suffocation record, like using that like original slam mosh like as a hook, you know? Or like, you know, on the last song, the descent to suffer, like the that guitar riff, like the that's like the only like later thing on here, I think. It's very like corpse grinder, cannibal corpse era, which again I enjoy. You know, uh I don't know. This it it's literally all my favorite parts of death metal mashed into one. So I love it. That's what's up. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone will check it out. Okay. Last thing we're going to talk about is uh, the band cut down from New Jersey. They put out a 12 inch called to the grave. It came out on scheme records, dude, everyone follow the scheme records, uh, sub stack someone on there recently, they reviewed every single 25 to life song, which is one of the greatest <laughs> things. <laughs> what, one of the greatest things I've read in a long time, but my man, I'm not going to send you an email like a well, actually email, but, uh, Dude, you left off where it begins, which is one of the greatest 25 to life songs there is. And no doubt. I demand a review of where it begins, but uh, I love that article so much. It was so sick. And uh, someone's got to put it out on print. Okay. This record is six songs in 10 minutes. Uh, this band did a split seven inch with that band Never Again last year. And if I'm being 100% honest, I like the Never Again side of that split more. So I was surprised this band kind of won the race to put out their next record. 
when this came out a couple weeks ago, it came with like maybe the best advertisement I've ever seen in the history of music. On Instagram, <laughs> the, the ad, it had a picture of this record and a picture of Victim in Pain. And it said, stop scrolling. In the next 25 minutes, you could listen to Agnostic Front, Victim in Pain, and To the Grave by Cut Down. You know what I mean? It's so <laughs> brilliant, dude. So brilliant. Very, very witty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't have too much to say about this record, really, except that uh, it's a Roots Hardcore record. It's six songs. All of them kick ass. Um, Every song brings the heat. And they do a good job with, like, there's a slight variation in all of the different, like, bass fast tempos, which is what makes it interesting. It is so straightforward, but doesn't come off samey. And also, like, the singer, he doesn't run from trying to write a hook either. What do you think, Todd? I love the record. I loved it from the first like from the first fucking note it hit um extremely aggressive um it reminded me of bands who were playing hardcore in the late 80s that were not playing youth crew hardcore and for some reason i'm drawing a blank but um like maybe like citizens arrest like more punkish influenced hardcore of that time uh just raging the citizens arrest like the life's blood like that kind of stuff yeah dude and it's just it's just it's hard without sounding overly moshy. That's what it is. It's a hard, hardcore band that doesn't sound overly moshy. Yeah, it's sick. What do you think, Pops? I'm going to take a little journey. So the first thing, yes. I'm a visual person. <laughs> I started off and I was like, this looks like the Cops and Robbers record that I never heard. So then I listened to Cops <laughs> and Robbers. And, and then I was like, oh, I like their cover better, uh, Cut Down. And so then I looked at their social media and they have us. They do these videos called Bagel Quest because I guess they're like, they're like foodies or something. And they go and they even do that thing that like you do on Foodstagram where you like you fold the thing in half so you can see all the layers and you pull the cheese apart. And you're like, this is a bacon, egg, and cheese, and this is Taylor pork roll or whatever the fuck everyone in New Jersey likes that like glorified bologna or whatever. So they do those. They have three of those. So that to me, I was like, these guys are really fun. Like these are fun guys, right? <laughs> they, and then I put on the record, and there's fake smile, poison loyalty, mortal world, your disguise, <laughs> Gnostic times. I'm like, these dudes are not fucking fun at all, and they fucking hate. There's three songs about fake people, so I was like, I hope they authentically like bagels because that yeah. would be fake, and they would hate themselves. That'd be fucking weird. But um, I like sort of. <laughs> So, sort of like the um, Thought Control record. I like that each of the songs had a hook that was like, the most obvious to me was Gnostic Times. It had a like an SSD part that I didn't expect, especially going through the whole record. Yeah, I was like, whoa, okay, curveball, awesome. But yeah, I like Todd's comment that it's like, it's hard, but not overly moshy. Like I, I, I didn't think they were always driving towards like this payoff that needed to happen. In fact, like sometimes they would wind something down or cut it where I didn't think it would cut or, you know, like the song AOD has like a, what I would call like a positive tempo shift, which I really enjoyed. So I don't know. I, I went into it maybe thinking like this might be even despite the name and the, and the very serious cover, I went into it thinking there might be like a, a jovial jokey Jersey shore playfulness and didn't get that at all. And and I came out of it just hoping that I'm a, an authentic person living in this immortal world. That's what I got. Dude, I hope so, too. I hope I hope that these guys deem me as authentic. Yeah, I saw him a week ago. And, dude, the guitarist is a badass. He downstroms, like, every single note, you know, which is, like, what I'm mm-hmm. looking for in a hardcore band, you know. And then the drummer is pretty exceptional, too. So, like, those two dudes, like, playing together as a unit, like, you know, you're halfway there to having a sick band. So much respect to this dudes. Any final thoughts, Todd? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of cool hardcore bands now. I think um, there's a lot of cool hardcore bands in LA right now. I saw a uh, major pain in wise the other night at the Fullerton skate shop at the program. Yeah. And um, I just, you know, I mentioned earlier about how popular like beat down hardcore is, but the fact of the matter is if you're willing to look, you'll find like some pretty exceptional hardcore bands. Yeah. Major pain is sick. Shout out Kenny. Shout out Coop. Uh, Pops, final thoughts. Yeah. I, just to expand on that, I think we live in a pretty amazing time where you can you can sort of isolate a style of hardcore you like. And there's going to be probably 10, <laughs> 10 releases, like recent releases to dig into that are all going to be quality. 
which is like, it's kind of like an unparalleled time. Now that doesn't mean like those are going to be your favorite records for the next 20 years or whatever, but to, to have that variety. And then you can just kind of hop and be like, I'm going to, I'm going to check out like this other segment. And I think that variety, like, you, you know, it's like going back to what you said about being a barnacle. Like if you can't find whatever, another band that sounds like no effects or whatever, like just listen to no effects and shut the fuck up. Like, I don't need to hear it. There's so much <laughs> out there that you can just pick and choose from. And because everything is free to listen to, if you've never heard power violence, if you've never heard whatever, if you keep seeing a band with a spiky logo and an interesting name and a bunch of Y2K people, you can check it out and it might be your new favorite band. Like I do that all the time. And I, I don't know. It's just, it's a pretty, it, it's not lost on me that, that we get to exist in a timeline where we have that. Hell yeah. Yeah. The good, good point. You know, son, you, you're not a kid anymore. Oh no, I go to shows. Dad, I already know all this stuff. Well, they don't teach you about everything at shows. Okay, Mr. Smarty Bands. So just listen. When boys and girls get a little older, they start getting interested in punk and hardcore subgenres. Starter kit. What's up, everyone? We are gonna do another starter kit. I have Daniel here from Sorry State Records and the band Scarecrow. What's up, Daniel? What's up? What is going on? Okay, everyone, you got to get in those archives first because on episode two twenty seven. Uh, Daniel helped us out and did a starter kit on Finland, which educated me a lot and definitely educated Ben, as you can tell from like the intros to those old 80s Super 7s. He's now dropping Finnish knowledge. So what's up? Um, <laughs> Daniel, for your second one, you decided to do Italy. What made you want to do this one? Man, I, I've loved Italian hardcore uh, since I first heard it. I think, you know, I, I made this playlist and it's it's sort of puts raw power front and center, which like they were the, the first band I heard. It was a blind buy for me. Sh shout out plan nine records in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I just remember picking up the LP um, screams from the gutter and being like, this thing is crazy. And I noticed everyone's names were Italian on the back. I took it home and played it and was like, wow, this is even crazier than I thought it was going to be. Um, and then, so I always kind of, had my uh, ear to the ground for more Italian stuff. And then, you know, once that stuff, you know, information started coming online kind of in the, the early 2000s or whatever, um, you know, I kind of dove headfirst into that stuff and really dug into the scene. It's just, it's such a unique sound. It, to me, it sounds nothing like punk from anywhere else in the world. It's very unique, but it is strange having Screams from the Gutter be your entry point. It is mine as well because it's such a perfect sounding record, right? And a lot of this stuff is pretty lo-fi. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, absolutely. And that that's, uh, you know, one thing I, I sort of felt weird about making Raw Power like the centerpiece of the mix because um, one, in a lot of ways, they don't sound like other Italian bands, particularly on Screams from the Gutter. But I think they do have a lot of the things that I love about Italian hardcore. But then I've also seen people complain that raw power, like kind of wasn't really part of the Italian scene as much. I think their singer like lived in London from even all through the eighties and they toured the U S more than they played in Italy. So they're, they're sort of a, a strange torchbearer, I think for Italian hardcore for people in the U S but um, they're just such a great band, you know, it, makes sense to honor that i think i mean they recorded that lp in indiana what a betrayal <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah paul Mahern did a great job though <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll get into that do you want to give any sort of uh italian hardcore primer at all yeah there there are a couple things i thought i'd say um the first is that uh i think one of the things to kind of understand about italian hardcore going in is this aesthetic of like wildness and insanity <laughs> which is something that if you're not sort of expecting it and braced for it 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 might take a second to wrap your head or your ear around because i know for me the first time i heard like wretched or some of these other bands i was just like this these bands are really sloppy and kind of shitty in a lot of ways and like like you said like a lot of the recordings are pretty lo-fi and i think for me I don't know whether it's younger or it was just the times, but I always sort of thought of like tightness and togetherness as ideals that we should all be striving for in music. And I think Italian hardcore sort of deliberately throws that out the window um, in pursuit of this sort of uh, craziness or wildness. And, you know, if, if you look at like 
some of the record titles like the the negazione uh declino split is called mucho salvaggio like very wild and the or, and then uh like the negazione seven inches tutti pazzi like t- totally crazy um so you know they're really kind of pursuing that as an aesthetic which is as i think what makes it so unique um and i think that's something that i hear in a lot of italian music like as i've sort of dug in like there's the kind of italian kbd punk kind of stuff like hitler ss and tampax mm-hmm. and um, ice and the iced and stuff like that a lot of that has a similar kind of wildness or over the topness about it and he, i even hear it in this sort of a record collectory thing but like Italian prog is a big genre and it just has this sort of like ultra care, ultra charismatic, like over the top quality that I, I hear as kind of a through line in a lot of the Italian music that I've heard. Um, so yeah, those are just sort of, uh, general observations, I guess, about Italian hardcore. And then uh, another thing to note, I don't know if it, it would come up as we're talking about the bands, but I think a lot of this music too is deeply political. So a lot of it comes from this very like European squatter culture. Um, you know, you might know about the the virus squat in Milan, but all these bands I, I would say are pretty heavily influenced by crass. Um, they're, you know, anarchist, um, have a lot to say. Their original records tend to come in like big poster sleeves and with lots of inserts and, tiny written text about things they're very passionate about. And I can't read cause I don't speak Italian, but, uh, that, that sort of, uh, all wrapped up in the aesthetic too. I love it. Yeah. I mean, it's very important to call out the wildness because it's all over this and everyone in the show notes, we will put the link to the YouTube playlist. Some of this stuff isn't on Spotify, so you got to check it out there on YouTube, but it will be there. Um, let's jump right in. First song, Raw Power, Fuck Authority, came out on the Welcome to 1984 compilation LP put out by Maximum Rock and Roll in the year, you guessed it, 1984. Yeah, so I I picked the song because I think this this song in particular is probably a lot of people's introduction to Italian hardcore, and it's it's just like a classic. Um, I love that it's the the guitar player singing on it rather than the main singer who just has the the best voice, which we get to on the track you chose from screams from the gutter. But, um, you know, like I said, even raw power just have that like wildness. It's just so crazy when his vocals come in and they're just all over the place. And when it all kind of like, uh, climaxes at the end and he screams like, fuck, I thought I (laughs) die. It's like, Oh, it's a, a amazing moment. I think this is so good. We got to call out the cowbell for uh, raw power of course it's there <laughs> and then you're right like this the singing is just so unhinged this song kicks ass it's just a perfect hardcore punk song this is a great like primer for the playlist um and we're gonna hook into raw power a couple more times throughout it so let's just jump on to wretched again everyone i'm not trying to disrespect anything by pronouncing things wrong i just uh went to public schools in Oxnard. So it is what it is. The next one is Wretched. The song is Promisi. It came out on the split seven inch with Indigesti 1982. This was self-released. What do you think, Daniel? Yeah. So I, I felt like uh, I had to represent the Wretched Indigesti split uh, on the mix. It's such like a seminal record. Um, it's sort of like the Chaos Cadre split when we were talking about Finland, it it comes very early and really sets the tone for a lot of the the music. I think it, at this point, um, Wretched are are still kind of finding their sound. They still have that like they have that like totally off the rails feeling that I love. But their their stuff gets so much more musical later on. But um, it still just has this like I don't know. It's it's just not straightforward at all. Something weird a weird texture kind of comes out of their like strange rhythms and stuff that I, I really like on this record. Yeah. The drummer is playing super fast, but he doesn't have like the right hand yet. So he's doing this symbol cheat, which is actually a great cheat for you drummers out there. You know, if your right hand gets tired, you just hit the symbol on every downbeat. Right. <laughs> um, this song rips 47 seconds. It's fast as fuck. And really for 82, I mean, it's about as fast as anything going. And there's not much to the song outside of it just being a burst of speed, which is notable. It's 82. 
hardcore is like taking over the world, right? Yeah. And I, I've sort of chose it for that. Like, uh, I, I tried to really focus on like the fast and wild stuff, uh, you know, to really give whoever listens to this a flavor of, of what kind of the, the deep cuts are like, rather than just focusing on kind of the more anthemic or mid pace songs that might stick out. So yeah, it's just like a, a straightforward hardcore ripper. Yeah. So going into the next wretched song, this one's from 1984. It's called Fenira Mai. And it came out on a seven inch of the same title. And now it's two years later and this drummer just rips. So this is super fast. He no longer has to do the cheat. His right hand is boss. Yeah, this is wild. It reminds me a lot of like the best Neo seven inch. Um, yeah. Just that it's so fast and unhinged like that, but like still concise and just great hardcore. What do you think? Yeah. Um, for me, <clears throat> I'd love the Fenira Mai EP. I think it captures wretched just at this kind of perfect moment when they are starting to add in like the, the weird chords and sort of the, uh, the strangeness and off kilterness of their later stuff, but it's still just like ripping and raging. Um, to me, I think Neos is a great comparison, um, particularly on the records after this. I always hear uh, De Kreutzen in there too, and there's like mm. these sort of like weird uh, chords coming out. And then you know when he's those shredded vocals are just screaming "Venera Mai," like you, I don't know, you gotta love it. <laughs> yeah, this is great. Uh, the one other thing I want to say about Wretched for our listeners is. We should mention like the 1983 seven inch. If you look at the cover, it's the same art uh, as the 1987 LP by the band Carnivore. So yeah. either Carnivore just straight jacked it or didn't know. But that is kind of a, a hardcore fun fact that should be called yeah. out. I've, I've actually um, seen that same image on other records, too, not just those uh, two. It must must be like a famous image from somewhere. Let's go on to Indigesty. Outside of Raw Power. Uh, this is the band that I would have been most familiar with. You just see the name a lot. Uh, the first song we're taking is No Al Sistema, and it came out on the split seven inch with Wretched in 1982. This was self released. What do you think, Daniel? Yeah, so this is the other side of the Wretched split. Um, Indigesti is a, a very different band. Um, I love how snotty they are. Like those vocals are just so nasty. Kind of reminds me of like early Necros or something. Um, yeah. You know, they're maybe not as like gnarly hardcore sounding as, uh, as wretched, but their, their rhythms are a little more locked in. And um, yeah, this is, the song is just like one of those classic, like early eighties, hardcore, like bursts of craziness and energy. Yeah. The Necros is actually a great call out, right? Like something like IQ 32, which is so short. Cause this song again is, it's like 20 seconds long and there's not much to it. It's just a blaster. And there's a little guitar hook in there. So they are doing something unique. Also, it's pretty wild because the singer sounds very young on this. And this is 82. But we're going to talk another song from 82. Uh, their song, My, came out on Sigardo Ralta. I, I butchered that. Um, that's yes. 82 as well. Came out on Hysteria Tape Recordings. The singer now, he sounds grown so it's wild like in that year <laughs> he just like grew up and instead of sounding like a kid on the split with indigesty now he sounds very hr-esque and it is so sick what do you think yeah to me like you know post split the indigesty sounds so influenced by bad brains to me like they obviously the vocals and you hear that even more on their first lp he starts doing that sort of like yeah thing that hr does like hitting those really high strange notes and i always thought this song the way it sort of teeter-totters between the mid pace part and the fast pace part I, I wonder if that's <clears throat> influenced by bad brains too like you know bad brains tended to go fast and then have the slow part be a breakdown but they they sort of flip that on its head but the dynamics of it are very much like the big takeover or something to me um which is very cool to hear and you know the the they still like have their own voice and sound very Italian, but sort of being so influenced by the bad brain seems very unique to me. Yeah. It's so sick It's a fast song, but it bookends with two big youth crew, Tom parts. So yeah. that is sick for the 185 listeners. What's up. Okay. Let's circle back to raw power. 
We are taking the song You Are the Victim off of uh, the You Are the Victim record. Came out in 1984 on Meccano Records. What do you think? Yeah. So, you know, one of the reasons I have Raw Power on here three times is because, like, to me, you just got to have You Are the Victim represented here. Like, I just, I don't know if I'd say it's the ultimate Italian record, but man, it is so good. And I've, I've always thought this is one of Raw Power's best songs. It has both a really, really classic guitar riff and the like anthemic vocals like you are the victim um, so good it's, yeah it's just like it's a, a excellent song i think also you know i hate to keep calling back to bad brains like i i feel like when we do these starter kits i have like two points of reference either it's bad brains or it's poison idea i swear i listen to more bands but <laughs> this song it almost has like a swing to it you know how like bad brains like pay to come you can almost shake your hips to it like this is a fast song, but you can almost shake your hips to it. It's pretty wild. Just that riff, like the do 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 do. Like yeah, yep. it's a total classic. It's so sick. And then the chorus is so catchy because you're you're the victim. So good, dude. This is a great one. Is this LP considered more classic than Screams from the Gutter? You think for most people? I don't know. Probably a lot more people know Screams from the Gutter than mm-hmm. this one. Um, I know. Probably among people who are sort of digging deeper into these seven inches and stuff, I think um, it's just such a less glossy version of Raw Power. They haven't added the double bass yet. You know, there's not as much sort of wild lead guitar. It, it is a, a very, very different band than Screams from the Gutter, which which you like better is probably a matter of taste, I guess. Yeah. And I mean, they're only one year apart, though. That's why it's so wild. And it's a lot of songs. So Yeah. And I, I think they had changed... Uh, a bunch of members too. Certainly they added the the lead guitarist guy for Screams from the Gutter. Yeah, let's talk well, actually we'll we'll talk that a bit on the Screams from the Gutter section cuz it is so wild that they have so many metal tropes but they don't they're not crossover at all. Like no one would accuse them of that. So let's uh let's table that and let's move on to you got to pronounce this band the Negazioni. You said it Negazioni. differently before. Negazioni. Fucking yeah. sick ass name, dude. Okay, yeah. the first song we're talking is Non Me Dire or Non Me Dire. Um, Dire. Dire. Dire, okay. Came out, this is a split tape with Declino. Came out in 1984 on Asa Rottle Tapes, uh, a split release with that and Dysphoria Tapes. What do you think about this? Yeah, this this split tape is like one of the kind of essential documents of Italian hardcore for me. Um, and it just got reissued uh, on the original tape format and on vinyl. So it's kind of a little bit easier to find right now, but um, I always love, really love Negazione. Like they, they really have that sense of like looseness and wildness, but to me, they always just, their songs are really like catchy and memorable. And even though this one is, um, I don't know. I feel like I, I could have really picked any of their songs from this side of the split, but they're just, uh, yeah, this, this is Nagazione. It's <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is great. It's a rough recording, but it's a cool song and they're really just bouncing between fast and mid tempo. It's like that old hardcore punk shit, like from the early, early eighties when it's like, we got two speeds, let's do it. We're hitting you with both like to keep you on your toes. Yeah. This is a great pick. Okay. Let's go on to 1985, same band doing a song called Tutti Pazzi, came out on a 7-inch of the same name, uh, and this was self-released. What do you think about this one? Yeah, this is one of my all-time favorite Italian hardcore records, and this is kind of their, I would hesitate to call it a dirge. It's not really dirgy, but it's like, it's mid-paced all the way through, and it's built around that weird sort of funky rhythm, like, (laughs) Um, but the vocals are just nuts. I mean... You know, Tutti Pazzi, everything's crazy. And you just, to me, you like feel the world crumbling around him. Like it's, it's just, man, it's unhinged to this vocal performance. They did a great job of making a song so manic. Um, and you're right. It is totally crazy sounding. And you did a good job of describing like the, like kind of the beat. If, if I'm being completely honest, I hate this song, Daniel. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah, this was like insufferable to listen to multiple times. Like, I'm not saying that it's chicken squawk uh, bad, like the NBC (laughs) song. But dude, for me, it's close. Uh, Although I do get the appeal, right? Because it's very catchy. The singing is wild. And it does like build up to that nice break part when like all the music breaks and he keeps saying like the Tutti Pazzi with like the accents. 
that is a nice little part, but th- this song drives me crazy. Yeah. I mean, I think it definitely is like trying to channel that feeling of like an anxiety ta- attack or something. Yeah. I, I could yeah, totally yeah. understand it. It is like hard to listen to in a way. Yeah. So maybe if you like put yourself in the shoes, it can be therapeutic. But then like if you're not in the mood for it, it, it like, you know, it does seem like a crazy person yelling at you. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they pulled something off. I mean, this is this is a piece of art. Love it or or hate it. You know, it's uh it's something. Okay. Let's go on to one of the coolest band names of all time, Cheetah Chrome Motherfuckers. The song is Telesin. It came out on their seven inch four hundred fascists in 1981 on Sesophonia Records. This is so early and so sick. What do you think? man this one is just so raw and disgusting um the i think the seven inches recorded in mono um it it has a really weird sound to me for a punk record like the the instruments are really separate so you can hear what everything's doing really well but it's uh the tones themselves are just like really raw and shredded um yeah this i really love this seven inch and i I think what kind of elevates uh, CCM too, is they have such a charismatic front person. I think he's kind of like in the like suck heavy or like Janssen from CMEX mold in that there's all these like crazy stories about him, like doing insane things. And I, he really like channels that on the record. He sounds like a crazy person. Um, and yeah, I think I think that's the case with a lot of these Italian bands. It seems like they sort of really value a certain kind of charisma in the the vocals, um, and that's all over CCM. Yeah, this is great. Like you said, the the recording is very interesting because it is like they do isolate everything so nicely, but it is super lo-fi, and those two things juxtaposed against each other are really unique and cool, you know. And this is just it's like a three quarter fast beat ripper you know it, yeah it, it almost it has like a, a 60s garage tone to the recording to me yeah you're right you're right it, i mean it's, it's very lo-fi in like the best way uh this is sick okay let's go on same band we're taking frustration part one came out on the furious party record which is uh 1985 so this is five excuse me this is four years later and we should say they did two tapes in 1983 And so, yeah, we're jumping a good four years and this recording is spectacular. What do you think? Yeah, they get really good recordings on this and their album. Um, And this, you know, sort of like Wretched, they get a lot more musical on Furious Party. Um, You know, this song's kind of complex. It has a lot of like rhythmic twists and turns in it. Um, It has a lot of that, I, I think, on their LP, especially, they really sound like De Kreutzen in places, having these sort of like creepy notes and intervals, but they still keep the insanity of the vocals. Um, and it, it's interesting, like all of these bands, I think on the playlist have records after the ones that I, I chose songs from and all the bands like really changed a lot on their later material in in most cases they kind of slowed down and dialed back the intensity but kind of ramped up the weirdness and ccm is like a really good example of that i think like if you like sort of where they go on this record like that sort of mid-80s italian hardcore thing um is is really worth checking out yeah the back half of the song is like almost a tsol sounding breakdown you know, but the singer is staying unhinged over the top. So like, again, like a juxtaposition of like early 80s, almost like gothy sounding punk with like this type of vocal over the top of it is so sick. So, yeah, that's and that goth gothiness, you know, that's definitely something I hear here and in like Wretched's last 12 inch. Like, yeah, it seems like that that was a thing. Maybe <laughs> it was so cool. OK. We are two screams from the gutter. Uh, Raw power. We're taking two songs off this. Uh, Let's talk Joe's the best first. And this record came out in 1985 and we did allude to it, but we should just say this was recorded at hit city in Indianapolis with Paul Mahern, who was the singer of the zero boys. Also, he's been the producer of John Mellencamp since 1998. So he struck big, although that doesn't mean shit to me, dude, because Hurt So Good came out in 82. So what's up? Um, 
Okay, Daniel, you chose Joe. You chose Joe's the best, and uh, I chose the other one. So let's get into this one first. Real quick, fun fact: uh, my band Scarecrow named after the John Mellencamp record. Oh, <laughs> we were, how about yeah. that? Yeah, we were we were like, oh, all these bands they name themselves after cool records. Let's grab something from the dollar bin and uh, <laughs> name our band after it. But um, yeah, well, Joe's the okay, best. So, so I wrote off Mellencamp in '82, but I think Scarecrow's '85 or '86. So let's give it well, a I longer think, uh, run there. Yeah, I, I think John Mellencamp's music is terrible. Um, so <laughs> I'm not the person to <laughs> make judgments on that. Well, that hurt so good video is like undeniable. He's just walking the streets, and it's a bunch of like worker ass dudes clapping and dancing it's undeniable dude come on oh i do remember that yeah i think that's what i don't like about it it always seems like it's his music's like pandering to the working class or something <laughs> don't ruin it for me daniel come on <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah. but all right Joe's the best. Joe's the best. yeah uh, to me this has always been my favorite song on screens from the gutter like um they they redo a couple of old songs that are maybe like more sort of anthemic or classic uh raw power songs but to me this one is really it shows what this iteration of the band is all about because it it has those like crazy guitar leads and like the the crazy drumming when you know even a bit of cowbell it also has that part that i just love which i think i think we mentioned it in passing on the finish uh starter pack that we did but where the guitar break comes and it does that squeal and then the guitar fade just the guitar lead just fades out and it goes yeah. silent and uh, it's that cool cowbell part, you know? So yep. I, I just, every time I listen to it, I wonder what the hell happened with that guitar break where they, they had to turn it off. But um, yeah, it's maybe not like their most anthemic chorus, but it's just, to me, it's like the prototypical screens from the gutter song. I just love it. It's so good, dude. It's just a ripper, right? And that, that guitar break, uh, with that band and then the cowbell when it goes back into the second verse, like it is so undeniable. This guitarist is fabulous. Like the way, of course, there's like the soloing or the noodling, which you can either love or hate, I guess, depending on who you are. I love it. But just the stuff he does with going back and forth between playing regular chords and then going to like little single string notes. Sometimes he'll do that on like the verses of the choruses. Like he's not going to do like a wanky move, but he just like goes from like a chord to like a single note a single like finger on a string. It's super sick, dude. And then he just lets loose at the end. Like that raging solo is so good. And then little double kick on the end to uh, scare Bedge off. But what are you going to do? Okay. I am taking the song. Jesus Christ. I put the wrong thing down. Don't let me see it. And this was always one of my favorite songs. I think it's the first song on side B. And I used to listen to this all the time. I, I got it like maybe when I was 18. And I used to just listen to side B over and over. I liked it more than side A because it it has wilder singing on side B. Is it two different dudes, Daniel? Yeah, I think it's the guitar player singing this song. Okay. Yeah, I like that dude more. Like, it's just completely throat ripping singing. It's so good. And this song, like, it has like that low thundering bass that just sounds so ominous. I, I can't tell if it's like the kick drum low or if it's a bass being low can you tell no i'm not sure yeah so it's one of those but like there's some ominous bass sounding shit going on and then you have like this pretty iconic guitar like the and then we kick into like that it's that perfect up tempo mid tempo like it's like as fast as you can down strum you know what i mean like is is pretty much my favorite tempo you know, and then it's a great song. Verse, chorus, verse, chorus. The chorus is pretty anthemic, but then it just blasts fast and it's so unhinged with the vocals. Like when it goes fast, like it's one of those moments in hardcore when it's like, God damn, this might be the most in unhinged, wild sounding shit I've ever heard. You know, and obviously like there's many <laughs> times that you listen to music and it feels like that. But like every time you hear something like this, it's just so sick. And then also those Tom fills on the fast part are so good. Um, yeah, I, I love this song. What do you think, Daniel? Yeah, I, I do too. And I, I think you kind of mentioned this, but sort of where it comes in the context of the record is so cool because it feels like this really 
big left turn that it takes. Like you're, you're listening, it's the same singer and it's all the, you know, it's mostly fast and has all these like dynamics and stuff. And then they just, they drop into that like chunky ass, like fist pumping rhythm. And then the vocals are, you know, are a total change up from what they are. It's just like, um, it, it sort of like tweaks all these weird knobs, uh, in a strange way from, from side a, it's like, it's more intense in some ways, but then like the rhythm is sort of dialed back from where some of the other rhythms are. It's just, it's a very, very cool move. It, it, it's, it definitely like makes you feel a bit weightless. I think when it kicks in on, on side two. Yeah. And, and I did check, this is the first song on side B. So I wasn't going insane. Last thing, Daniel, what do you think the cover of this is? I don't know. It may be some sort of, mutant alligator in like a, <laughs> a sewer full of toxic waste or something i don't yeah i don't know that's my best guess yeah it's definitely like some sort of alligator or bird you know something maybe like a i don't know some sort of bird with a long beak that's, that's getting to toxic avengered out and the the color scheme on it too i mean like it just it couldn't have said by me more you know when i was like 18 or whatever and picked it up it's beautiful <laughs> yeah sick like the color scheme on here is better but like it it does remind me a bit of like the decry record you know when you're going there and you just do like pink it's pretty sick dude yeah you know <laughs> okay final thoughts italian hardcore yeah there's you know this stuff is killer there's a lot more than this too italy is a very deep scene um so if you if you like these songs um there's a very seminal bootleg called the furious years of italian hardcore that'll sort of send you to the next layer below this in terms of obscurity and then there's several layers below that so if you if you develop the taste for the the wild stuff there's a lot more of it to hear dude i love it daniel this was great thanks so much yeah thank you yeah.